This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Age 16, Chris joined the British Army Apprentice School in Arborfield at Princess Marina College. He was trained as a vehicle mechanic in the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers, otherwise known as RIMI. We talk about life expectancy in war scenarios, experiences with crash-out exercises, the tragic losses of comrades on exercises, and life as a British soldier in West Germany. Chris also served in post-war Berlin with the military police, and he describes an interesting secret job that he was involved in. The episode was recorded at one of the Hack Green Nuclear Bunker Living History Weekends, where Chris is one of the reenactors. His advice has proved valuable to the other reenactors as he is someone who was actually there. It's a great down to earth account of a sometimes forgotten part of the British Army, without whose support they wouldn't have been able to operate. I'm delighted to welcome Chris to our Cold War conversation. I was uh, born in Hull, brought up in Hull. Always wanted to be a soldier as a little lad, grew up. Um, tried to get into the military school uh, when the, the, the army used to run schools for children. Um, at the age of 16, I went to the army careers and they told me about the apprentice scheme. So I ended up going to the army apprentice school in Arborfield. Uh, Princess Marina College, where I started as a vehicle mechanic in the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers. Spent uh, two and a half years there and then moved on to Borden in Hampshire for my trade training. The whole time we were at Borden for the trade training, it was a lot of uh, lessons on armoured. Um, although I wanted to be a, a B vehicle mechanic, i.e. soft skinned and wheels, they were pushing armoured all the time. Um, so, you know, obviously in preparation for going out to Germany, the BAOR, um, a lot of work on old-fashioned 432 armoured personnel carriers, the main workhorse of the British Army out there on the uh, on the front line, as it were. Um, my, however, my first unit posted after training, I went up to Catrick to 24-air mobile brigade, uh, 15 field workshops which was the forerunner for 16 air assault. We were actually trialling the air mobile capability because uh, everybody decided that the helicopters were a good idea for fast moving. They realised that the armoured war was coming to an end, especially with all the uh, the build-up of the Russian forces. We were massively outnumbered in Germany and we weren't expected to last too long. We did have a plan. I could go on about uh, life expectancies and things like that, but that's uh, you know it's so wide and varied depending on what role you were in. The whole time I was in 24 air Mobile Brigade, we used to exercise out in Germany six weeks at a time every year, um, usually back end of the autumn. Um, and again, it, it meant all the different units used to come together. We used to support the armoured uh, infantry with our heli airborne role and, uh, and, and skip around all over Europe, really, mostly in Germany, northern Germany, heading out towards the borders. Got over to Wolfenbottle, which is quite close to the uh, the East German border up there. Did you actually uh, go and see the border at the time? Yeah, we did. It, it, to be honest with you, it was an hour and hour weekend, and we got the chance to nip in a minibus and go and have a look. And it was a, a, a German driver who took us out there just to have a look at the fence line and, and the watchtowers. That, was, that wasn't far from Wolfenbottle. Um, well, one little funny about it was we, we stopped for a, a pee break, and we're all uh, by the side of the bus trying to have the pee, and the German driver has made us pee pointing towards the east so that the guard, guard towers could see us pissing on their line, basically. Um, he refused to let us piss on the west side. Oh, brilliant, brilliant story. Um, and you, you mentioned around life expectancy. I mean, what, what, in your training, were you realistically told what might happen? A, a lot of the time, we... we <laughs> The army don't like putting negatives on things, so everything was a positive. And uh, they didn't like talking about it too much because, obviously, they didn't want to scare the lads. If the, if the balloon went up and we went out there, we didn't want to know that we only had 24 hours to live. Again, being Remy, we were technically 
behind the lines. Remfs used to cause rear echelon uh, mofos. But uh, the, our particular unit, we were in a fly-forward team, so if the, the front-line lads had problem with their vehicles or weapons, we used to fly forward to try and fix them for them. So with regard to whether or not we were front-line troops, we weren't really, we were there as support. Um, but they used to say if there was two shots in the, in the, when the balloon went up, the first shot would go, the second shot we'd be on a ferry. But uh, the, the, the vast advance of the, the Russian army, the Red Army... Was was so quick. We, it was basically we were fighting a, a rear part, a rear guard action all the way to the coast, and and there was obviously plans in place that people at my level weren't totally aware of. I did know we had a few little secret bits and bats, like most of the bridges on the Rhine were permanently mined. This, I mean, this is going back from the sixties onwards. Mm. Um, the Royal Engineers used to talk to us a lot, and they told us there, were, there was always like sleeper mines in a lot of the bridges and the main supply routes. Uh, which would be blown behind us as we uh, as we retreated back. Um, yeah, that's why the, the actual life expert. I mean, the the paras they'll tell you it's minutes, uh, depending on which infantry unit in it's hours, and then obviously the the further further back you get, the longer you're supposed to last. The armoured infantry were the worst because they would have been been among it. Um, many many an exercise. A lot of the big exercises we used to do out in Canada as practice. It was often the ambulance and the Remy truck were the only ones surviving because we were always on the other side of the hill waiting to go in for support. As many a times we've been the last vehicle standing when everybody else had gone. Um, but again, the, even the training, the training in the in BOI was dangerous. It used to lose lads on on exercise, and that was only supposed to be practice. But it's train hard, fight easy. That was the old motto. You expect to lose a few. Big boys toys, big boys rules. Yeah. No. I've I've heard um that phrase before and i think that that the casualties on exercise and in training are the the forgotten dead really i mean you know they're not commemorated on any war memorial or, or anywhere it was a real show i mean uh, i used to train out with the i was posted to second light infantry i think we're telling light infantry for a while we went out to canada with the warriors again it was all training at that stage it was all training for the uh the the, the cold war as is um, the, the threat was still there, and we were we lost three lads in the space of seven days on one exercise out in Canada. They were supposed to cancel it after two casualties, I believe, but uh, because it had cost millions to set up and everything, the uh, the brigade commander got us together and said, "Look, lads, this is tragic. We've got to really watch what we're doing, but we're going to carry on anyway." We all agreed. It, it, it's a fact of life. If you if you're playing with bombs and bullets, somebody's gonna get hurt somewhere along the line. Don't matter how safe you are, accidents happen. Otherwise, they wouldn't be called accidents. Yeah. Um, and it is the way it is. Like I say, we lost lads. We knew some of them, and it, you harden up to it. Uh, and there's the always, you know, there's a famous squaddy sense of humour. We were telling jokes hours after it had all happened. It's all a big cover up. You can cry in your own time. And the sergeant major pulled us all together and said, "Look, this is the score. This is a big boys' game, and people are going to get it. Just watch your backs and watch your mates' backs." No, I appreciate you um, sharing that insight. Um, so you were in Remy for the through to the end of the Cold War. Yeah, that's right. I joined '84. Um, like I said, my first tour was Catrick. Uh, it got to. I went out to uh, BAOR. Uh, served with the military police, attached to the military police. In actual 1990, I was in Bergen-Horna, which again was a, a two armoured units, two infantry units, the Scots Guards were there, I think, and um, just like Queen's Dragoon Guards, I think they were there. We were basically supporting, I was supporting the military police who were policing those units that were there ready to protect the border if the balloon went up. Um, but we obviously had that police outstations dotted all over northern Germany. It was different then with regard to the type of soldiering we were doing. We all had crash out kit. We had had a locker with all our kit, all our uh, webbing and all our uh, deployment kit all sat ready to go. And we used to have crash out exercises. The armoured lads and the infantry lads used to get them a lot more than we did. Um, admittedly, I mean, we had a real time job. Even during peacetime, we still had to keep the vehicles going. Those lads were practicing and training, whereas we were actually doing the real job as well. Uh, they got crash out exercises quite regular, so they'd have to go get their locker, and they might have an hour and a half, two hours notice to move, and they didn't know if it was real or not at the time. 
uh, a crash out would go a call would go up you'd go to, go to unit get your gear on sit and wait on the bus off the bus it's on it's off we don't know where we're going we don't know what we're doing sometimes a, an exercise would follow but usually you'd have a whisper you used to get uh, rumor control to let us know what was going on a couple of days in advance if we knew we were going to be away and it was a bit rough for the, the married guys because you know obviously they didn't know if they were going to you know, have to le leave the family behind for a couple of weeks or whether or not they'd be back within a couple of hours and it's funny they always seem to manage to have a crash out just after a, a company do or something and we'd all be in a bit of a state as you can imagine because we used to work hard and play hard I could imagine that yeah they really wanted to test your resilience there did you have any encounters with the Soviet military liaison units that were uh, moving around West Germany? Uh, the old socks mist. Yeah. yeah. We were all issued with a, a what they call a socks mist card. Um, I actually knew the Brits mist guys. One of my uh, OCs in in my first unit was part of the Brits mist, which was basically the unit which had free range to to go wherever they wanted to go around the the the, uh, the, the area, visiting whatever site they wanted to visit. And we had, the military police had units called the White Mice, and they were in long-range white Granada cars, fully uniformed military policemen, but the, the, the cars had uh, long-range tanks, so they didn't have to worry about, because the vast distances covered across Germany and East Germany, and if a Sox Miss vehicle, a Soviet vehicle, because they all had special plates, if you spotted one, you had to report it straight away, you'd usually see one of the White Mice behind them, if not, you'd report it. They'd try and trace them and then just follow them to see where they were going. And they did exactly the opposite on the other side. Um, there's lots of stories about guys that, you know, disappearing off, running out of fuel, having to call a, a helicopter in to refuel the car and whatever because they hadn't managed to, to keep it going. But uh, a lot of the time it was good-natured. And also the, the, there was the inspections. Every, every, every now and again you would be told there'd be a... Uh, an inspection team coming over from the Warsaw Pact or whatever and we had to prep the unit ready to be inspected by the enemy basically we used to cover up we had vehicle boards with all the registrations on and all the states of repair we used to have to cover those up because we didn't want the enemy knowing what our capabilities were whether or not we could actually deploy um, so there was a you know two days of prep before that inspection but again we would be briefed that that was happening before it had happened and and with those inspections, I mean, how closely were they looking at your equipment? They knew what they were looking at anyway. Let's face it, by by the 80s, everybody knew what everybody had anyway. Everybody knew how they were trained. There wasn't many secrets. The main secrets came to the intel and the signal side of life. Um, personally, I couldn't tell you how in-depth their inspections were on that, but they would have had to wander around the vehicle parks. They would have been taking photographs, no doubt. But again... Even when we were deploying on exercises, there were civilians with cameras at every location taking photographs of every vehicle going in and out of position. We used to see them all the time. And they used to know where we were going some of the times. If we got lost, we'd ask these guys and say, oh, yeah, they went over there. Because the fog of war, you might say. Mm. But it was the same with the guys who ran the Brattyvangs, or Wolfgang up in northern Germany. He used to have a, a battered old Mercedes van selling Bratwurst and Mars bars out the back for the troops. If we got lost or we were looking for another unit, he knew exactly where we were, which bush. He says, oh, yeah, second bush on the left, they're in there. And this is a civil German civilian just selling us sausages. Yeah. Well, he's a famous lad with old Wolfgang, saved many a squad his life. Right. <laughs> it sounds like I'll have to get him on the podcast. <laughs> You're lucky. I think he's dead now. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> get a medium. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would you say was the, the worst thing about being in, in your in, role in BAOR? BAOR call what it's the unknown not knowing it could it could come any time obviously you get build up um you understand you know the chatter goes up all the intel starts coming something's happening they're building up on their side they were putting a lot of exercise on doing this. it's much the same as it is in the ukraine now we knew that was going to happen a week before it happened and then it escalated so you, you would get your intel you'd know it was like but it was the they're not knowing you're out there to do a job the biggest enemy to the soldiers out there was the boredom waiting for something to happen so that's why they used to train you hard but that's also why alcohol was cheap petrol was cheap that's why the boys then got themselves into a lot of bother the waiting just waiting 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 for something to happen so you train for life to do it you're looking forward you're itching to get out there and do it 
unfortunately we were asked to do the impossible there's no way we could have stopped them coming forward everybody knew that but by hell we'd give them a right good chance at it yeah. you know we'd have a right good go um and every everybody was there for that same reason do your job do the best you can do mm. outnumbered like you've never seen we had a lot of better kit but they did not well they proved it in the second world war numbers means everything yeah yeah and and so d did you have periods where you thought actually this looks like this is getting for getting real dodgy. in in fairness no i mean it was dodgy enough on exercise like i say you, yeah, yeah. you never knew if the tank was going to roll through your position or whatever there, were, there was all kinds of, of of hazards but in fairness in, we didn't think we didn't think they were that stupid to actually start anything to be honest it's not like it was the Cuban Missile Crisis at that stage. Things were calming down quite a lot. I mean, late 80s, we, as, as it proved, 1990, everything stopped, didn't it? It finished. So they were, they were, they were on wind down, and we kind of knew it anyway. But we still had to practice just in case. It could have been a big ruse. But nobody's... They're not that stupid. They're not going to press that button. Mm. They're not going to not going to come over. Um, I know things are hotting up a little bit now, but again... I don't think they're that stupid to do it. No, no. And that's what that's kind of what we relied on. If if it, if anything had happened, I think it, I'm sure it would have been a mistake. Mm. That would have triggered everything. Mm. But again, we'd have been ready. A couple of hours' notice to move. Stand by. And uh, can you remember hearing about the the Berlin Wall opening? <laughs> Very well. Like I said, I was with the military police at that stage, and we had a station out in Berlin. Uh, I remember it was a, I think it was a bank holiday weekend or there was, it was something we, we were in the bar and we we were on the piss we were having a right I think we'd had a rugby match and everything and uh, we got a phone call from the, the lads in Berlin and they said get your ass over here quick it's all kicking off and we thought they meant duties we thought they were rising. he says no 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 you've never seen a party like it and half of the guys in the mess went oh I don't know it's a long way to go it's only a couple of hours or whatever well, I'll go, I'll drive. So I think half a dozen of the lads all jumped in a motor or two and zipped across there. And the rest of us went, oh, I can't be bothered, I'm sat here at the bar now. One of my biggest regrets in my life was two days off and I didn't go to Berlin on that night. Yeah. I'm quite a fan of uh, Hasselhoff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, apparently, yeah, the, uh, the military police out in Berlin did warn all the other military police to get over there. Massive party. And uh, we couldn't be bothered, we were too busy drinking beer. Yeah. So, with the military police, did you go to Berlin after the wall had opened? I did. Uh, not with the military police. I went over, I was asked to go and do it. Um, I, got a, <laughs> I got a phone call from our BME, a brigade electrical mechanical engineer. He says, I need a volunteer to go and help some lads out in Berlin. Uh, plain clothes, pick a car up and pick two lads up and zip over to, to Berlin through the corridor. Mm -hmm. I didn't know these lads from Adam. As far as I knew, I was just a driver for the day. Turned out it was a 24-hour duty. I got given a, 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 a pack lunch, and they said, so oh, just drive where we want you to drive. And I don't know who these guys were. I know they were armed, I wasn't. Um, and I, I, I'm assuming they were some kind of sneaky-beaky. I don't know whether they were um, signals, intelligence, or I, I, I don't know. But I, that was my first viewing of Berlin. It was from a, a car. And just sat there, got out, went for a walk, came back. Right, we're going here now. And, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know who they were. I, I, I think they might have been British government. But I, 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 they just didn't seem to be squaddies to me. Yeah. But, again, that, yeah. that was my first show in Berlin. Second one I went on uh, on a weekend as, as friends. And uh, the, the, but the wall had been down a couple of months. And my biggest memory, there was a fantastic floor market, uh, flea market mm -hmm. actually at Brandenburg Gate. And there was lots and lots of Second World War and Soviet gear on the car boot cell. And they were giving it away. You could pick up an AK-47 or a hand grenade or something. And it was phenomenal, the stuff that was for sale. Yeah. And it was pennies. But uh, the, the, obviously there was a, it was all upbeat. Everybody was happy and smiley. You actually got to see the uh, East German border guards. They were still knocking around on the other side. At that but they were just pulling gear down and emptying offices and what have you. Waving and smiling. Yeah, everybody was happy about it. So yeah, that was my that was Berlin for me. I didn't I didn't see a lot, but uh, what I did see, I enjoyed. And the guys you were driving around uh, Berlin were they? That was around East Berlin. Uh, no, it was on the west side, right. but it was close to the actual wall and the, and the border. Uh, I, I do 
I remember we were we stopped off at uh, Spandau. We, we, were, we were next to Spandau. I can't, for the life of me, remember the name of the barracks. Wavel. Wavel. Wavel barracks. barracks. Yeah. Um, again, I, I was yeah. I was just told drive here, drive yeah. there. A lot of it was in the dark anyway. But I did I did see the wall, what was left of it in places, seeing where it had been torn down as well. Um, yeah, but that that's all I really knew about uh, Berlin. No, no, I understand you can't you you can't share everything, and I and I appreciate you know what what you shared with us now. Um, what was the best thing about being in the army? Would you say in in Germany itself the best? Yeah. Oh, it was uh, in fairness, it was the lifestyle. Like I said, beer was cheap. I was a single single soldier for the first two years there. Uh, cheap beer, cheap petrol. Everybody had a nice car. Great great places to visit. If you if you could speak a bit of German and, and get into the local scene as well, it was nice. The, the the locals liked you to try and speak German with them and integrate with them. They knew straight away who you were and what you were. And more often than not, if you'd ask for something in German, they'd answer in English anyway. But they appreciated you trying. A lot of lads married German girls and uh, integrated that way. I was uh, I was a scout leader when I was out there. Uh, helping the garrison kids so we used to have links with the local german scout groups we got to know them that it, it, yeah it was a great place i brought a young family up after two years we got married and i brought a family up out there and it was great great for the kids they loved it and the families and it, and it was like i said the lifestyle was good um and it uh, it was uh, it was like well it was it was it, it was like a little england in in camp but you could go out and be in germany at any stage yeah, yeah it was it was nice pleasant i was in the north of germany for the first tour up in Horner and then I moved on to Paderborn near Senelager to 2LI in the armoured infantry after so it was it, up north was a little bit rural and then we came into the town for the second tour so we saw a good a good range of it and the skiing was good it was like a good nip off skiing right uh, yeah good life plus, yeah it was it was good but again at that stage things had started to slow down anyway the tension was yeah the, the, I wouldn't have said there was tension per se a lot of tension was created by the exercise, the not knowing, at that time. But it was easy to forget after a few beers. I can imagine. I can imagine. Uh, you you mentioned about being in the military police. You, so you, you transferred from Remy into military. No, I, I wasn't military police. I was attached to the military police as one of their mechanics. Right. Uh, there was three of us. There was a full full corporal and two lance corporals. Uh, we were called Tiffies when we were attached to the military police whereas Tiffy to the rest of the room he's our Tissifer she's usually a staff sergeant and above uh, but that was their nickname for us I think the Navy called their mechanics Tiffies as well um, we were told to wear well we, we, we wore red caps but we wore our own Remy uh, cap badges um, and we were the, the, being with the military police was interesting because they weren't very well liked by all the other units they were known as the baddies they still are today Nobody likes the police at the end of the day, especially if they're the ones who are arresting you on a Saturday night for being drunk. But we were all corporals together, so our military police corporal's mess was a really good mess because they put a lot of effort into it because they couldn't really socialise downtown with the other units. However, being Remy, everybody loves Remy because they'll get your car through its MOT. So we, we were pretty bulletproof as the, as the, as the Tiffies. But we had a, the military police themselves we were adopted as part of their family I had a really good three years with them and uh, yeah they were some really good lads they were only doing their job at the end of the day but uh, yeah like I said the, the infantry units tended to use them as a natural enemy yeah. and I think they still do today but a lot of it's banter anyway yeah, yeah. You, you'll all end up having a beer a bit like the RAF and ver versus the RAF yeah well I, can't, I never understand the RAF I don't see why those boys don't want to join the armed forces when they could have joined the army and had a real job I'll let you uh, have have that argument. One last question. I noticed when you were out on the gate doing a uh, a guard duty earlier with some of the other reenactors, and um, you were showing them what to do. So were you were you given training beyond obviously maintaining military vehicles? I mean, you 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 had some idea how to run a checkpoint. Yeah, as a roomy soldier, you, uh, you're a soldier first. You have to do all your infantry training. Um, I have served out in Northern Ireland as well, so I've gone through all the Northern Ireland training. Um, being a re I, I fell into reenacting by accident. Um, I bought a, a jacket off somebody because I wanted a jacket, and they realised I was ex-army, and they asked if I would go along because most reenactors are civilians, they've got no army um, experience at all, and they asked if I'd go along and show them a few pointers. This is about 15 years ago, 
and it's been a slippery slope ever since. So you tend to find the lads that want to reenact are really keen to learn the history and learn how to do it right. So as an ex-serving soldier, they try and glean as much off you as you can. And as a reenactor myself, I would like them to look as good as possible. Mm. I can't beast them around like we used to as, as, as young uh, recruits, but teaching them simple ways to hold their weapons, ways to use the weapons, ways to hold their bodies when they're wearing the correct kit, to wear the kit correctly and things like that. So, yeah, like this morning was a vehicle checkpoint. They'd done them in the past, but they didn't know how to do them properly. It took me 10 minutes and already I'd, I kind of opened another window as to show them the standard operating procedures, basically. Uh, well, yeah, like I said, once, once it's in there, it's hard, hard to get rid of it sometimes. No, I can imagine. Listen, I really appreciate the time you spent with me and uh, the insight you've given. I mean, some incredible, I'm just going to say stories, but they're not stories, but just, just a view into areas that people wouldn't be aware of as, as life in the BAOR. Yeah, basically what you've got to remember is we're just, uh, oh, war, where normal people, all right, tough job to do, still had lives to live and uh, families to support and all the rest of it. We're only human at the end of the day, but we're human with skills. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.